So uh, here we go. Oh, I'll go and share the screen. Ooh, turn the heat off. All right. So 17th, class number 20. Oh, so we got a letter in class um, every time I get mail. Back when I was doing the cantina, we had money to spend. We would buy all these things for class, you know, all these cool things. And now they get, we have no money. So anything I buy comes out of my pocket. So what I bought for them was the masks. Um, they're like for little kids, like 30 masks, little superhero masks that I'm going to have them wear in case I film so that don't allow me to do more uh, live filming in class. If they're wearing their mask and their eye mask, I think we're probably safe as far as FERPA goes. Just so I can capture more of the class. Okay. Yesterday, we talked, we, we already, this, I, I went over this in class, but we really already talked about that in here. Uh, we talked about a perfect a perfect bow tie is that situation where you throw a ball up and you catch it where you threw it or you roll the ball up an incline or you punt a football and it's caught by the by the receiver or by the on the other team well that is not okay that's projectile motion when i punt the football or when i throw a baseball or hit a golf ball but it acts just like free fall and we'll get to this more later, it acts just like a ball rolling up and down a ramp or like free fall, um, except that there's an X component to it. So it's considered, projectile motion is considered free fall on a, on a conveyor belt. So my point, my point being that, that this graph shows up a lot, as does this graph. If it's, this is considered a negative skewed, skewed bow tie if i am throwing something up and it lands below me uh, th there is an ups part to this if i just straight up drop it then that means that this part it just isn't there there's seven situations i'm getting ahead of myself and then if i if i um throw it up and it's caught like it's, or it's, say i throw the volleyball on the west lawn up and it gets caught in the sycamore trees it reaches its apex on the way back down, it gets caught. That would be this situation. So, talk about that in class. And so, we ended up with this number. This, this won't take us that long because we, we were trying to catch up in class from where we were. We ended up, after all that work and all those screenshots you looked at, we finally ended up with this being the acceleration, the diluted acceleration due to gravity of a ball up and down an inclined plane. And that is what g that is what the acceleration of gravity actually is if there were no if there were no air drag and there were no there was no inclined plane a ball or a rock would fall back to earth at that speed at that acceleration of speed but at that increase in speed uh, so we then um in here on this class let's see i think ours is here here's the one we did so yesterday we did this looking at acceleration and looking at our percent error. And so our percent error was 28%, but in our defense, um, and by the way, we did a whole thing today on this is theoretical physics. When you, uh, decide to uh, become a physicist or major in physics. Undergrad doesn't matter, but when you go to grad school, especially for a PhD, uh, you'll have to decide whether you want to do theoretical physics or empirical physics. So the basic difference is what we were doing when we roll the ball up and down the ramp and get numbers and take data, that's empirical physics. So you do a lab, you do an activity, and from that you, cre you, you collect data. And from that data, you, you determine the relationship. In theoretical physics, you don't do anything. Um, you don't do any kind of lab. So a, you, you just think uh, and you through, through mathematics. So people that are more inclined towards math, towards calculus, differential equations, uh, matrix mechanics, 
they are more on the theoretical physics uh, track. And that's more me, I'm more math. Uh, but then somebody that loves to tinker, likes to, if you're one of those likes to take apart your toaster and, 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 and works on car engines all the time, I mean, I can do that, but I'm not great at it. And I'm not, and I'm kind of think it's cool, but I'm more in the theoretical think it's cool. Like, like I want to go graphic and see, well, look how this changes and look at big trends. I'm not so interested in the you know, details of the machine. So uh, uh, if you're like that, you'd be more of an empirical physicist. So at OU, we have Dr. Kieran Mullen. He's a, a theoretical physicist. So he thinks theory, he, he looks at trends, he looks at equations. Um, they give him a real nice laptop and he has a good sound system in his office and he kicks back and puts his feet, feet up and, and, sit and, and ponders all day. And then you have somebody like Dr. Johnson at OU, uh, who's a Matt Johnson, he's a great guy. I think he's now he's at West Virginia, but uh, he was the master of the lab of the lab. And he could, I, I followed that guy around for two summers and he could tear anything apart and look at it and he learned a lot. Um, man, he could build anything. So he's he is a empirical physicist. And so most major universities will have a couple of theoretical and a few empirical. Uh, physicists, okay, kind of whatever floats your boat. Like the Large Hadron Collider, that came from Peter Higgs. I mean, the original idea, Peter Higgs and and the people around him, um, you know, posited this idea of a of a boson or some kind of a field that gave everything mass. Well, that's theoretical physics. There was no machine that could do that. This is the 1960s, and finally in the 2000s. Well, in the 1990s, they, just, they agreed to build the Large Hadron, they built the Large Hadron Collider in Europe, you know, Switzerland, underneath the ground of Switzerland, France. I'm not just going on to what we talked about in class, so I'm trying to get to the feel for the class. Uh, we actually had one, we were building one here in the United States. Anybody know where that was? We, before they built the Large Hadron Collider, we were building a super collider in the United States. And guess where? Dallas, Texas. Actually, Waxahachie, uh, which is a little south of Dallas. And we, we poured in $4 billion into it. Uh, then, then at that point, um, it was supposed to cost originally, it's a huge, uh, it's like, 30, I don't know, 20, it was 25 miles maybe in circumference. It was really big. It was bigger than the Large Hadron Collider. And we would have done major breakthroughs, world, we would have been world famous. It would have changed Dallas, of course. It would have changed OU. OU would have, would have had three or four physics buildings by now. Norman would be one of the top premier physics institutes with tons of money. That would have changed everything in our area. But Congress pulled the plug once the, once the bill got to about $4 billion, they pulled the plug and they left a $4 billion hole in the ground. Yeah, I don't know what they use it for. Maybe they store trucks down there or something, but they don't do anything with it. So that's, that's when theoretical physics, which doesn't cost much, then all of a sudden switches over to empirical physics. Now you got to pay the bills and we, we wouldn't do it. Europe took up the mantle and they went ahead and finished it. And now Europe's building an even bigger one because Europe believes in science. Whereas America has fallen way behind in science in the world. We used to lead the world, obviously, Manhattan Project, et cetera, et cetera. Don't get me started. So this, what we did here is theoretical physics. We, this 51.3 centimeters per second per second is what, it, is what the ball should have accelerated when, I, when we let it go. Well, we came up with five reasons why that wasn't true. One, this angle here, we, we said three degrees. Well, their iPhones were telling them it was somewhere between two and a half and three degrees. So that, if it's 2.7 degrees, that makes a big difference, you know, because cosine 2.7 is a lot different than cosine, uh, sorry, cosine 86. 7.3s, whatever, it's a lot different than 87, see what I'm saying? Or 88. So that's one thing. Another thing is these numbers that I used to come up with this, they were not made up. It was sort of like a class average. Like I said, well, 
I mean, I was hearing six, you know, a little over six, I was, let's say 6.6 .6, uh, seconds. And so, and then the 200 centimeters we say it went was once again, sort of a, just a guesstimate of what people were getting. So that's the reason why we are off by 28%. Uh, high schools, really high schools should be, uh, here I wrote this down, for a typical high school in physics lab, you should be even a, you know, elementary lab like we have, uh, we should be at, if we're within 15%, that's good. Uh, more Norman uh, tech should be definitely within 10% uh, because they have facilities that are at rival uh, junior colleges and also rival even OU. OU uses some of their stuff. So they have a river of money and don't get me started about that either. So, but really, I wouldn't accept 28% error without explanation. So most high schools are about 15%. Don't be any worse than that. Junior colleges about should be within 10%, like O-Trip or Rose State or something. OU undergrad would be, if your lab is within 5% of what it's supposed to be, um, you can write off a lot of the other stuff I'm saying, human error, uh, you're saying friction, whatever. Grad school, now your equipment's a little better. You should be within 1% of the, of the uh, correct answer or of the theoretical answer. And then corporations, uh, you know, Moderna, all this stuff is in the news now uh, for their trials. And as far as equipment goes, they should be within 0.1% at least, depending. And if they're not, they got to throw more money at it. That's why you end up spending $10 billion to, buy, to build a large hadron collider, because you've got to be accurate and the Large Hadron Collider gets the speed of the proton pack up to 99.9999999999, the percent of the speed of light. And they have to, to, to make their numbers precise. So that's, that's where these billions comes in, is this need for accurate data. That's why scientists get a little pissed off when some random politician says that it's fake news. We spent billions and spent decades to get it right. Okay. I'll get off the soapbox. Now we're gonna spend the rest of the time here working on this, working on this theoretical, um, developing the two of the three orange kinematic equations, okay? So I'm gonna go through this kind of quickly. So start off with what's, what is the symbol for position? And that is just X, you can say Y, you could say Z, you could say S, but we're just, gonna, we're just gonna call it X for now, keep it simple. What's the symbol for displacement? That's Delta X. Um, what is the equation for average velocity involving total displacement, total time? Well, on the back of 2.7, we ended up with, uh, with this equation. That's just, that was finding the slope, right? So uh, I'm not gonna put that tau on there though. We'll just say that V bar, we'll say V bar equals Delta X over T, keep it like that. And then what's the equation for average velocity involving initial velocity and final velocity? So that we also did, that's those two tangent lines the tangent line, the beginning, its slope, and the tangent line, if it's a parabola, the beginning tangent line and the final tangent line, their slopes are equal to the slope of the secant at the mid time. And that's what the, basically what this is saying. That's the essay question on your take home test is basically that idea. If we're, like, where the heck does that come from? So this is V bar oops, orange, V bar equals V naught plus V final divided by two. And then the next thing is what's the definition basically of acceleration? Well, we said that acceleration equals change in velocity over time, right? It's the slope of the V versus T graph, but they wanna do it in terms of initial and final velocity. So acceleration is V final minus V naught divided by T. Okay, so we have 
Yeah, that was interesting. We have these, from these three equations, this guy, this guy, and this guy, we're gonna develop uh, the orange equations. All right, so the first one, to be honest with you, the first one we've already kind of already got. Uh, if you look at the beautiful patterns back on 2.8, we've already done this equation, but let's go ahead and this first orange equation. So we have a, blow this up here. So in this situation, if I have a graph and it's V versus T, not X versus T, uh, or X versus Y, remember from algebra, you get Y equals MX plus B, that's the equation for a line. Well, here, if there's no, if there's no uh, Y intercept, or no, in this case, V intercept, this would simply be, and we're saying, instead of saying Y equals MX, we're saying V equals, and the slope, as we saw from the V versus T graph, the slope is acceleration. So V equals AT. If there is a V naught, which a lot of times there is, then the equation is, uh, you know this, same thing, only now you talk, tack on that. So now we say V equals AT plus V naught. Now that should look familiar because it looks like the red equation, but remember, I don't have that called up. Oh, I do, I do, I do, hold on. Remember this, um, back here, here we go. Somewhere, oh, sorry. Okay, right here, all right, here, we did this because remember when we say like right here, if we, we're doing a diagonal and so this equation, blow this up. So this equation here, um, we have this is the right equation, right? X equals VT plus X naught. Well, we said we can do the same. You can do the same thing. Eventually I'll figure all this out. You can do the same thing with, with the, what you dizzy, with the V. So X equals VT plus X naught. And therefore, because of that same pattern holds, V is equal to AT plus V naught. And then later we'll do the pink equations and one of the pink equations is A equals JT plus A naught. Okay. So let me point that out. Where are we at? Here we are. Okay. So back to this. So that is the first orange equation. But for some reason, textbooks show it this way. Textbooks show it as V final equals V naught plus AT. Exact same thing, they, for some reason they switch it around. Okay, that's the first orange equation and I hold it up to the class and say, okay, I'm gonna hang this in the ceiling. It'll be in our equation sheets. Now, the rest of the hour, or the rest of this time, we won't be in whole hour, we'll be out of here before then. The rest of this time, we're going to derive the second orange equation. So the second orange equation, I'll write it down here, is delta x equals v naught t plus one half a t squared. Um, that is the second orange, I'll give you a chance to write that down. That's the second orange equation. That one, we're now we're doing real kinematics. And, We'll start working on problems tomorrow involving this equation. Um, once again, we already had a preview of this. Uh, if I go back, I'll try this again. I'll do it smarter this time. If I go back here and look, we have this equation already. It's right here, right? Except, except we said that we can, we don't need to call that. Remember we said that from our empirical data, we said that we don't need to call that X, that K anymore. That's really one half A. And so empirically uh, from actual data, we saw that one half A T squared. So with that's if that's assuming that V naught was zero or yeah, V naught was zero. 
but uh, what the second orange equation, so we already kind of knew that. Galileo kind of knew that, uh, but from the second, we, we need to do it algebraically because I want to know how to get there, not through a graph, but through algebra. Well, that's the advance that Newton had over, oh, oh, oh. that's the advance that Newton had over Galileo. All right, so let's do the steps then. So it's a tradition. If you want to do theoretical physics, and even, even an empirical physicist has to be able to do this, but this is the great thinkers of Einstein. I would say Einstein and probably and Newton are the two greatest theoretical physicists. Newton did a little bit of work with optics, but he wasn't in the Galileo was like your classic empirical physicist. The greatest empirical physicist of all time has to be Michael Faraday in the eight, late in the mid to early to mid 1800s uh, because he, he was the great experimentalist. He didn't understand, he didn't have the math background, but he was an amazing, he, he, started, he, he, he started electromagnetics essentially. He built the first motor, the invention of the century, um, only because he was a tinkerer, you know? Edison was not, Edison was a tinkerer. He was an inventor, he wasn't even a, he wasn't even a physicist. But, but if, you want, if you want to be a, in the theory, then there's some techniques here. So we're trying to uh, derive this formula. Now you go, hey, Mr. Askey, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Isaac Newton didn't know the formula before he, <laughs> okay, but we are trying to go back and think like Isaac, um, think like Newton, right? So we're doing these little exercises to get your brain to start thinking this way. But anyway, the technique here, if I'm trying to solve an equation for delta x, what, what I wanna first do, obviously the most important variable here is delta x, right? That's what I'm solving for. So I need to come up with an equation or find an equation. Oh, by the way, one of the rules is if you've developed an equation, you get to use it if you want. So we, there, now we have four equations to go with. That'll shorten our derivation a little bit. All right, so I wanna use, my first equation I want to use is, and I made the kids tell me in class, but the first equation I want to use is this one, right? Because it has delta x in it. So you have to introduce it. You can't just, the, the problem with my smartest students have trouble with this because they want to get right to, they want to do like five steps at once. Well, when you're doing a derivation, you're writing it for an intelligent eighth grader who's sitting in algebra two. Uh, he or she is a bright kid, but they, they're just ignorant. They just don't know this. So you need to be cognizant of your reader. Um, I get a lot of students that, that are really bright and they just don't go anywhere in science because they can't communicate. So Delta X, it's a fine art. Communication is hard. But you just have to be patient. So we have V bar, sorry, V bar equals Delta X over T. What? That's not right. Yeah. Delta X over T. That's what I had. I was thinking tau, right? We're not using tau. So just plain V bar. So, so the, the reason for that is introduction, intro. All right. And then you want to get it by itself. So first you introduce the evidence, like the chess player, the pieces, you introduce that, then you gotta manipulate it. So you want the delta X to by itself and the, the universal, you all, when you isolate a variable, variable, you always put it on the left side. So I'm gonna do two things at once. I'm gonna isolate delta X, multiply both sides by T, and I'm gonna move delta X to this side. So delta X then equals V bar times T. And so the answer, the, the reason for I can do that is ISO and RE. Now, RE is a catch-all explanation. It just means I'm doing some kind of algebra to it, all right? We used to, when I first started doing this, I would make them go through all the details. That's not really important. The important is, it's like when you, when you write code, like I have, I have you know, programmers for my, for, on my bot, on my, my robotics team, and they're really good at doing programs, but they're not so good at commenting it out. And so I make them comment it out. I wanna know, if, if they're going to show it to me, I got to see comments. You know, I got to see why is this, what is this, and they hate doing that. But you need to comment this stuff out as to why you're doing it. Okay. 
well, I've got, I, I, I got somewhere, I got Delta X isolated, that's cool. But see, it's like Delta X is having a party. And Delta X has a party and Delta X wants to bring on V naught, he wants to bring V naught over. He wants to bring time because time is cool. Time's gotta be there, right? He wants to bring acceleration on because man, you wanna accelerate a party. So those are the people he wants at his party. He does not want dumb old V bar, Mr. Average. He doesn't want V bar there. So he's gotta get rid of V bar. Uh, that's sort of the game you play here. I gotta get rid of V bar and get it, replace it with something. So up here, we see, aha, there's an equation I can use. So I introduce, and I kind of made the kids kind of figure this out. V bar equals V naught plus V final over two. See, this is one of the disadvantages of zooming is I can't really work the crowd. It's, it makes a big difference. So that's intro. I mean, I can explain things to you as I'm going along, but uh, you know, you can't help but zone out because I'm not, you can't, you're not involved. Anyway, doing the best we can. So um, now what do I do? Substitution. Okay. So yeah, the normal, the, the normal procedure is intro ISO sub. And there is a derivation on take home test 2A where we're doing a little bit of this. It's only like six steps. So I don't need to isolate it though, because V bar is already isolated. So you're right. The next move is to sub it in. Now, the common courtesy when you're subbing in, in a because remember, you're, you're, you're writing this, your audience is an intelligent eighth grader, you know, a little brother, little sister, or something. Um, and so the common courtesy is to highlight what you're subbing in. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to sub it in for this. So put a little arrow there just to, just to show them. Because sometimes they go, what'd you just sub? Okay, so this is substitution. And so now we have uh, delta x equals v naught plus v final over two times t. Ah, so now my party, uh, Delta X's party is starting to shape up. Uh, he finally got rid of that boring old V bar, but uh, daggone it, when you know it, every time V naught shows up to a party, his daggone cousin shows up and is gonna ruin the whole, the cops are gonna be called, he's gonna get into a fight. So we've gotta get rid of V final. Anybody got a suggestion? How can I kick out when you're trying to kick something out, you got to have a, you got to do a sub. So what's my, what's my equation I need to introduce now so I can get rid of that V, v final. Also, I don't have A either. I want to get a, I want to get my buddy A in there. Uh, v final equals V naught plus AT. Right. So because we derived the first orange, that's going to cut a step off our derivation. So um, let's just, first we got to introduce it though. We're like a lawyer. Got to inter introduce your evidence. V final equals V naught plus AT. I think what I like about this, I like the logic of it, I like the rules. You know, I like to have rules. And really, nature has rules. Uh, okay, so that's intro, and then it's already isolated. That made it nice. So once again, and by the way, this derivation will probably, it'll be on, won't be on the test, obviously, Thursday, but it'll be on the test after Thanksgiving. So now we're going to isolate, we're going to substitute this in for V final there. Right there. And now I can rewrite it. My back to my delta X. Delta X equals V naught plus V naught plus AT all divided by two. And then big parentheses there. You got to put. Students don't put in the parentheses and they lose points. You know, you mess with a TI-85 or something, a TI-89, and you don't put a parentheses in. I keep getting the wrong answer. I, yeah, you're not putting your parentheses in. Uh, and that was simply sub again. Um, now, 
Now my party, look at the party for Delta, for Delta X. It's got V naught. It's got two V naughts, even better. It's got uh, um, A, he wanted A, and it's got the T. So everybody that's supposed to come to the party is there. Now all that they got to do is do a little matchmaker and rearrange them. And so Delta X, then let's do a little bringing together. That is two V naught. I'm going to, uh, you can do this legally, move the T if it's divided, be divided by everything. Plus a T. This is where algebra, just the skills of algebra, you can really tell when students don't have those algebra skills. That's critical in physics if you're going to do theoretical physics. And that's simply RE. We're going to say, you know, rearrange is all we're doing. And now what do I do? Oh, green kill pin. Kill those twos. But now what do I do? I'm almost there. Can we add a t to t? Uh, yeah, well, we can distribute. We can distribute. So let's distribute the t to here. Oh, I'll change that color. Let's distribute the t. The t goes to here. Yeah, this is going. It goes to here, and it goes to. Here. I'm trying to make yours look nice because you're the probably the one I'm going to take. You know, put on the screenshots. So I distribute the t to both. And voila, I end up with, oops, I end up with delta x equals v naught t plus one half a t squared. And that's just, I'm gonna, like I say, I blanket all those distributions, factoring, I blank them in it all into this category just called rearrange. Okay, so we did it in eight steps. Um, that's about the minimum I'll take. If you do it on a test and you give it to me in four steps, you're probably going to lose points because you combined. I mean, you've got to be, like I say, you've got to be patient on a derivation. You're making those derivations so that readers can, in other words, you can communicate your thoughts. So many of my students are brilliant, but they cannot communicate their thoughts and they're not going to make it uh, at the next level if you can't do, especially in grad school. That's why there's so many terrible professors out there because they don't communicate their thoughts. Well, we're not going to do seven, but if you wanted to, if you wanted to do a little preview of using this equation, just for, just for fun, I know you got other stuff to do, but we'll worry about it tomorrow. But um, tomorrow we'll do seven. Oh, um, you go, oh, yay, uh, we're done with packet two. No. Uh, I put together six more sheets because we're going to have to expand pack. We, instead of this would have been the end of packet two, but I made the decision because of snow days and all that we're going to expand packet two. I'll go and turn to stop sharing off. Stop sharing. So I'm going to actually, I'm going to stop recording too.